Hey, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Trends Update webinar. My name is Chris Lopez. I am an investor here in Denver and also an agent with Your Castle Real Estate in Denver, Colorado as well. Today's webinar, we're going to go through a bunch of trends at the national level because real estate's both national and hyper local. So this is the 30,000 foot perspective on the big trends, financing, all that great stuff. And I've got a great group of presenters and very smart people in the room with me. First one is Mr. Lon Welsh, who's a founder of Your Castle and also is a very savvy investor. And this guy knows his numbers and trends. So make sure you take notes. How are you, Lon? I'm fantastic. Thanks for having me today. I'm always excited because I always uh, I always get a few uh, always a few ideas from you as an investor and also as a real estate agent. And I also got Nick Elder. Nick, you're with Iron and Capital. How are you doing? Life is good, Chris. I'm glad to hear that. And Nick's in the studio here in Denver. And then we got a remote team member with us, Zach Garfius. Uh, and he's out in California now. What's up, Zach? So, hey, uh, Lon, we'll start going through a bunch of data here and some very key questions that realtors and investors are asking us. So we'll go through that, not in every single detail, but feel free to ask questions. We'll be monitoring those and we're happy to share the slides with you as well if you want to download and really digest the data. So Lon, I know we got a lot of questions out there, a lot of stuff in the market, man. What is happening? What's your crystal ball going to tell us? We're going to go through all the pros and cons of what's happening out there and hopefully give people some sound bites they can use right away. Wonderful. Well, I know uh, a big question out there is uh, how is working from home impacting everything? Yeah. So let's take a look at that. So I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, we've got about just over 150 people who registered, about half our investors and half our realtors. Uh, and of course, the realtors not only work with investors, but they might be investors themselves. So I'm going to mostly talk about this from the investor point of view. For those of you who are realtors, if you'd like me to do a different version of this where we talk about this just from how to explain these ideas to consumers to help them get off the fence, I'd be very happy to do a slightly different version of this where we just talk about the scripting on those sort of, sort of ideas. So uh, shoot us an email or a text or whatever is easiest for you, and I'm happy to talk about that. Um, this would be a great one from a consumer standpoint, from a topic standpoint. This was a survey of are you planning to move in the next year? And this is the first time I've actually seen this. It was done by apartment list, but I think that the consumers who live in homes are probably very similar stats. And you can see that the hybrid workers, uh, almost half of them plan on moving in the next year. The fully remote, not quite as much. And the people who are fully on site are the least likely to move in the next year. So it's really good intel for you if you're a realtor working with more consumer oriented uh, people. Uh, you could talk to the people in your database. And if they are hybrid, you might just share this with them and say kind of what are your plans uh i know that you're living let's for, say for example in uh, downtown dallas fort worth because you want to be close to your job and for the same price of the condo you have there you could probably buy a house out in the suburbs and have a whole lot more space maybe a nicer kitchen get a better school district is that something that you'd want to explore in the next year so there's some uh, script ideas on here that you can use with making those sort of discussions and this whole presentation you can download it if it uh, be of any use to you all right. So is there going to be a foreclosure boom? So most of these other sections we're going to go through, I update them once a month. And a lot of these uh, slides, they actually do change a little bit every month. So if you find these useful, please uh, join us next month and we'll show you the updated stats. So I don't think there's going to be another foreclosure boom. And I'll show you a couple statistics that support why I believe that. The first is taking a look at how strict or how easy is it to get mortgage credit. And this goes back to 2004, and the higher the number, the easier or the looser the standards are, and the lower the number, the more conservative or tight the banks are in granting mortgages. And you can see in the run-up before the 2007-2008 crash, lending was extremely lenient. Uh, my dog actually bought a doghouse that year, and then he never <laughs> made a payment, so the bank foreclosed on his doghouse, he had to move back in with us, and that was all okay. Uh, for a lot of people, it wasn't such a good outcome. But the main point here is that since about 2009, lending has been very, very strict. So the people who have, been got, who have gotten mortgages over the last 12, 13 years have all been extremely financially qualified to get the mortgage. That's the first reason why we won't see a foreclosure boom get repeated. The second reason is, is that just about everybody who owns a home did a refinance when the rates were in the 3% range. <clears throat> so if you take a look at the entire mortgage payment of America divided by the total disposable income of America, what you find is that about 4% of disposable income is required to service all those mortgages. We have the lowest debt service commitment right now that we've ever had in the last 40 some years. So 
there's not likely to be a lot of financial distress. And since if you look at 2007, right before the last crash, you can see over the last 40 years, the highest debt burden that we had for mortgages was right before the last economic crash. So not particularly surprising that was a big cause of a stress for America. Does that make sense? It does. And it's just amazing on that the very far right of that uh, spectrum there, just how low we are. Not just comparison to 2008, but the other previous crashes as well. Like, yeah. It's just really, really low. Yeah. There's uh, just not a lot of debt services. Everybody refinanced, took advantage of the rates. So that's the second reason why you're not going to see a foreclosure boom. Um, <clears throat> the third is, well, this, this is showing you, well, how are the number of foreclosure filings look? So you probably have seen these alarming headlines that the number of foreclosures has more than doubled in the last year. Well, there's a really good reason for that. Uh, Biden said that during COVID, uh, during the main part of the crisis, uh, it was not allowed for a lender to foreclose on a house. So all the people who weren't making payments went into forbearance and there was no foreclosure activity other than the ones that had already been initiated. So once that stay was lifted, then all the backlog of people who hadn't been paying their mortgages, there was a wave of foreclosure to get caught up. So is it true that in the last year that mortgage activity uh, foreclosures has increased a lot? Yes. As Mark Twain said, there are lies, damn lies, and statistics, and this would be a great example of that. I think the more meaningful example here is take a look at versus 2010, and we're at like 10%, 8% of the foreclosure activity that we had during the last peak of foreclosures. So don't let the headlines mislead you. The, the press has a very short memory. Well, they also want you to uh, click on their headlines that's so right. they can yeah, get their exactly. clicks and make their money. I mean, that's in the day, that's what they're doing as well. And 252%, it gets clicks. Oh, yeah. Yeah. If it's bad news, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. <laughs> All right. The next piece of evidence that I don't think that you're going to see a foreclosure boom is the amount of equity that people have in their homes. And I'm going to show you that two ways. Currently, right now, about point. 4%, less than 1% of Americans are underwater. And by that, I mean the house is worth, le is worth less than the debt that's currently against it. Uh, please compare this back to 2008, 2010, where about a quarter of the homes in America were valueless. They, they had less value than the debt against them. So when you had someone who had really poor credit but was still given a mortgage anyway, and the debt service as a percentage of their income was really, really high, and then their house was underwater, had no value. If there was any kind of a hiccup, someone lost a job, someone got sick, the only alternative was to give it back to the bank. We're in the exact opposite situation right now where the debt burden is very low, the lending standards have been very strict, everyone has a lot of equity in their homes. It just doesn't make any sense at all that 99% of the Americans who've got equity in their home would walk away from it. They would hire a realtor, probably someone on this call, to sell the house, take a check, and then leave. They're not going to give it up. So you may ask, as a stress test, what if prices were to drop 10%? Well, then we'd find that 2% of the homes are underwater. Uh, what if the prices dropped by 15%? Uh, a stunning 4% of the homes would be underwater. So even if we have a large price correction, more than 95% of the homes will still have a good equity position in them. Yeah, that was a really <clears throat> that was a really mind blowing statistic when you when you did because it was like, hey, what if this happens? And you think a fifty percent correction, like, oh my gosh, it's gonna be a huge ripple effect. It's pretty minimal. Yeah, like, doesn't really matter it's much. It's not gonna move the needle. Yeah, I, I've looked at this so many different ways. I made so much money during the last foreclosure boom. I personally would just love to see another foreclosure boom. It'd be great for me financially and for everybody who's dialed into this. I'm sure you're all thinking the same thing. It's it's just not gonna happen. Okay, here's a more graphical way of looking at this. The yellow line shows the value of all the homes in America. And then the red line is the value of all the mortgages that are outstanding. And the, the spread between those is the amount of equity that people have in their homes. So you can see in 2007, 8, 9, after the crash, collectively, we didn't have a whole lot of equity. We we're actually in a negative position, which led to a lot of foreclosure activity. And that led to the very large recession that we had in 2007 and 8. Uh, now we're on a record level of equity in people's homes. Uh, this is a, not a chart you see in the media because it's too happy of a message. Okay, here's just some qualitative uh, things that you can think about, about the things that were in place just before the last housing crash and what the current situation is in the economy right now. So if you take a look at the job cuts that we had right before 2007, about 8,000 people net of gains had lost their jobs. This current housing cycle, you see that we're still creating lots and lots of jobs. Uh, people who lose their jobs are much more at risk of having a foreclosure, of course. Um, we've added almost 25 additional people who've got a W-2 job since the last big recession. Um, number of subprime loans, 
during 2000 to 2007 was very prevalent. So when we talked about the poor quality of mortgage credit before the crash, most of those were subprime loans. Uh, For those of you who are newer to the industry, there was this really amazing loan, I can't even believe this happened, called a stated income, stated asset loan, where you wouldn't even have to produce any tax returns, wage statements, or any kind of documentation. You would just say, hey, my income is $200,000 a year, and I want to buy a million-dollar house. And they'd say, that sounds fantastic. You're approved. Here's the check. Go buy a house. And you'd say, well, you know, I don't want to put down a down payment. I want 100% financing. Yeah, we have a loan for that, too. It was just absolutely remarkable how irresponsible the lending was. And it's nothing like that right now. So um, the amount of new homes that were built in the five years before the last crash was about seven and a half million. And there was starting to be a large glut of new homes on the market. There wasn't enough buyers to be able to take them all. And that added a lot to the pressure once the market went into decline. Uh, By comparison, in our last five years, you can see that we've built 3 million homes less. We're actually building homes not quite fast enough to keep up with population growth. And that's a large part of why we don't have enough inventory to be able to sell. Uh, Mortgage delinquency, we talked about that. This kind of expressed as the number of foreclosures on an earlier slide. And the number of homes in foreclosure is very, very low. So if you if you think there's going to be a repeat of the 2007, um, none of the large economic indicators really point to any sort of a repeat of that being very likely at all. So something on a W two salary jobs are long. <clears throat> I was talking with the, an actually investor and a lender yesterday, and he, we were talking about the same stuff. And he was like, he said what he has not seen in data. It clicked a light bulb for me. Was hey, we're in a gig a gig economy now. We weren't in that. 2008, but everyone can put their cars on Turo or Airbnb yep. or drive for Uber. And I haven't seen much data, and I don't know if it's easily trackable, but I assume that just adds more potential income and yeah. upside for people. And have you seen any data on that, how that impacts, you know, W-2 payrolls are easy, but the gig economy, I just, I hear headlines and podcasts about it. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that explicitly broke it out. You know, this chart shows the total mortgage payments divided by total disposable personal income. So that would be W-2 as well as 1099 from gig jobs like Uber. Okay. But they don't disentangle uh, where the income came from. Somebody somewhere at the Federal Reserve Economist Group, do you know that the Federal Reserve has more PhDs in economics than anybody else on the planet? Literally. I did not know that. Yeah. It doesn't surprise me much. Yeah. They, they gather a lot of numbers. And they have a lot of guys looking at them all. So anyway, uh, not much chance of a foreclosure. So your crystal ball is saying really, really, really low chance. Yeah, really low chance. I think you will see, if you go back to this slide, that you're going to see headlines in 2003 saying that we had record high foreclosures in 2022, and they won't say relative to 2021, and that you'll see that repeated in 23, that there'll be more foreclosures in 23 than 22. So maybe it goes up to 250,000 versus 165. Okay. And they'll make a big deal out of that media. But com- again, compared to 2010, it's a rounding error. And I think that's a really good thing is move on to the next topic here. I know we have a lot of agents um, you know, on the webinar and you know, clients forward us this headline or they snapshot this crazy thing from the mm-hmm. Wall Street Journal. So agents, you'll get that. And now you can give a high level data as to like, hey, here's how it you know, probably won't happen. Or download the slide deck and forward on these seven slides and be like, hey, you've yep. got this data. Yeah. Yep. So the foreclosure boom or lack of is a major component to our next topic is will prices drop? Because I think that's a very common topic for a lot of the buyers, uh, for the agents that I talk to every day, that people who aren't buying, a lot of them are waiting for this reason. Mm. And why is that? Well, if you survey uh, Americans, two thirds think that a housing crash is imminent in the next three years. So we just showed you that's probably not likely. But if you need some additional um, firepower to answer this, um, this will show you the number of people who are distressed sales. So earlier we just looked at foreclosures Um, This is foreclosures and short sales. So it's the total encompassing view of distressed sales. And you can see uh, from a little bit like July of 2020 through maybe June of 22, there's that period of almost nothing. That's the forbearance period. And then the forbearances were gotten rid of. And you can see there's like a tiny increase since then. Um, That will continue to increase, but nothing like it was in 2012. So... If you ask the economists who do this for a living, are prices going to drop? Um, you can see that the consensus across all these would be is yes, prices will probably drop in America uh, somewhere around the 5% range. I don't know that you're going to see that big of a drop. I think you're going to be somewhere between minus 3 and plus 3%. I think it's going to be pretty close to flat. Is it possible that individual cities will see drops? Absolutely. I can almost guarantee that's going to happen. Will it be minus 25% like we saw in 2007? Not a chance. No. Nope. Could it be minus 3 Yes, and you'll see some of that. 
more specifically within specific suburbs or specific neighborhoods, I think that you will see areas that have 3%, 5% drops, but you'll also see areas that have 3%, 5% gains. Um, it's going to be just kind of a quiet year for the most part from a pricing standpoint. Well, I'm also excited to see, I mean, we're recording this, what, middle through February right now, which at least in Denver, this is like we're getting into like prime time selling yep, season yeah. out here. And I mean, the market is pretty darn hot. Like yeah. multiple offers, people, you know, double booking showings, like it's hot again, which is kind of very early indicator that, hey, there's interest and buyers are out there. Yeah. And there's not enough houses in the market yet. Yeah. Yeah. I think what's happening is that there's been a modest uptick in the buyer demand, but the amount of inventory has gone down slightly. And so we're getting kind of back into where we were over the last couple of years in the spring where there just wasn't enough inventory. Um, and that's, I think, going to be your headline of the entire year. So if you're like, what's the crystal ball say? We're not going to have enough supply in most places. That's a boring headline line. <laughs> yeah. It's something that's the world's crashing, man. Yeah. Well, I don't have that for you. <laughs> Regrettably. So um, the guy who's the uh, assistant secretary of housing, Dave Stevens, had this great quote uh, back in January that this might be the one and only window for the next couple of years to get in, into the buyer's market. So we've got a window right now where it's not overly competitive relative to the standards of the last several years for buyers to go buy homes. And if you're working with a trade-up buyer, a lot of sellers, at least in the Denver market, I can't speak for the entire country, have a willingness to take a, con a contingent offer. Um, where like two years ago, if you would have said, hey, I need to sell my current home before I can, you know, there's a little laugh to your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, like I've got six offers. I've got five that aren't contingent years is, is like, you're not going to talk to you. Um, so take advantage of that. You can refinance the loan to get a better rate as soon as that's a possibility. And we'll talk a little bit about your odds for that. Will the recession that's coming up going to wreck the market? Okay, are we going to have a recession? So if you ask the economists, uh, a lot of them seem to think there's a recession coming soon. Uh, if there is a recession soon, when do you think the recession is going to start? Most economists think second quarter of this year. So why do they think there's going to be a recession? So the indicator that most people tend to look at is something called the yield curve. Uh, so what that just means, it's, it's a fancy word for a relatively simple con concept. If, if the government borrows money for like 30 days, usually the rate at which they borrow it is less. And if they borrow it for 30 years, they have to pay a higher rate because the investor's tying up the capital and there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen in the economy over a 30-year period. And there, there's other choices. They can borrow for 90 days, a year, two years, five years, 10, and 30. Those are the most common uh, types of treasuries that you see out there. And usually it's a very smooth curve that the longer you borrow the money for, the higher the rate is. What happens before a recession, though, is like what you're seeing right now is the Federal Reserve has to tighten up the rates to try to cool off the economy. And as a result, the short-term rates start to go up quite a lot. Mm. If the short-term rates are higher than the long-term rates, that's called an inversion. And that just means that it's an unusual situation where short-term borrowing, oddly enough, is more expensive than long-term borrowing. And if you look over the last 40 or 50 years of data, Every single time, no exception. Every single time there's been an inversion in the government bonds, a recession has always followed. Hmm. So it's a pretty safe bet the economists are making based on 40 or 50 years of economic history. Uh, so that's why people are saying this all the time if, if you're curious about that. Does that make sense? It makes sense. Yeah. I've also been hearing that for last year, and I'm waiting for the recession to come. Exactly. <laughs> so. uh, the so-called recession we keep hearing about so but much. But I'll pick that bone with the economist, not you. Exactly. So anyway, the yield curve uh, inverted to March of 22, so that was 11 months ago. So you might ask is, well, if this is such a great indicator, what's the median amount of time between when the yield curve inverts and when the recession actually starts? And the answer is 18 months. So you could see the last uh, several recessions that we've had dating back to the late 1970s. And it's been anywhere from like seven months to 35 months. So it's not like it inverts in the next day you start your recession. There, There is a lead time. So we're about 11 months into it right now. Uh, so, you know, it, it, the economists are telling us second quarter, that'd probably be 14, 15 months, which would be just about the median of what we've seen historically. And like the other, like just, you know, tangent on here, you mentioned it's just, you know, been like the wage growth. Yes. And I know a big issue the Fed's dealing with is, you know, un unemployment's not going up. Um, or at least the way I think they want it to. Right. And again, you said if people have their jobs, they aren't getting unemployed, less reason for them to sell or the need to sell out there. There's no distress. Yeah. Yeah, they'll stay put. You know, everyone's got a house that's probably at like a three, three and a half percent mortgage, so it's not like a lot of pressure. Right. Okay. Uh, this just shows you um, once we went into recession, how long did the recession last? The dominant situation is it lasts for about two quarters. This is from like 1949 to current. We did have one example in 2008 and nine, which is a really severe recession where the recession lasted for a full year. 
Uh, that's really uncommon. Two quarters is usually it. So your best guess is that we'll probably be in a recession in the second and third quarter of this year. We'll be back into recovery by a uh, fourth quarter of this year. So is the world going to end for real estate if we go into a recession? The answer is probably not. So this is what happened to average home prices across the U.S. during our last six recessions. So not too much of a surprise in 2007 and 8, uh, home prices dropped by 20%. That's not because the recession caused the price drop. The housing crash caused the recession. Um, all these other situations were a situation where the economy just slowed down enough to become in a recession state. And for the most part, you see that homes, they go down 2%, they go up 6%, they just sort of stay really, really close to zero, just like we were talking about earlier. That's a large part of why I don't expect prices to do anything really exciting this year, so we're probably going to be in a recession. So um, if you have a buyer who says, I'm going to wait for the recession because I'm going to get a better deal than I can get today, um, looking at this chart statistically, I'd say that's wishful thinking. I think in a couple of years, they're going to wish that they bought during this time. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Oh, when's the best time to buy real estate? Yes, 10 years ago. Yeah, right. And then yeah. today's the next best day. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, well, so what about mortgage rates? That's what's holding up a lot of buyers. So uh, rates have been declining uh, and they're still historically attractive. So let's talk about this. So this shows you the average mortgage rate by decade. And you can see in the 1980s, it's hard to comprehend this, the average mortgage rate was almost 13% as opposed to, uh, I pulled this chart together on February 8th or 10th uh, when the mortgage rate was 6.1. I think it's like 6.35 or 6.4 now. So it's gone up a little bit since I built this chart two weeks ago. This chart is absolutely impossible to keep current. <laughs> um, so are the rates higher than they were in the decade of the 2010s? Absolutely. Um, historically speaking, the last 50 years, the average mortgage rate's been 7.75. How's the rate compare? Pretty good. Um, I can tell you that in the decades of the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s, we sold well over 100 million homes in America at rates over 6.1%. So is it possible to have a functioning real estate market with these horrendously high rates that we're experiencing right now? Like, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Did it for decades. So uh, if you ask all the economists uh, what's going to happen to rates this year, um, they're all sort of expecting a modest decline. I think these are probably just a little aggressive. I do think that you'll see rates drop, but maybe not quite this much. Okay, this chart is a busy, busy chart, and I apologize for this, but it's got a really important message. And if you walk out of this presentation, presentation today with like one or two key messages, this is what I want one of them to be for you. So this shows you the average mortgage rate in America over about the last 50 years. And what I highlighted with the gray bars is all the recessions that we experienced in the economy. And if you look really closely, what you notice is that every time, every time we've had a recession, mortgage rates have fallen without exception, every single time. Now, when the rates were super duper high in the 70s and 80s, those drops in rates during the recession were very material. Uh, more recently, I think you want to look on the right-hand side of the chart where the rates have been starting from a lower basis. Uh, the average is about a 1% drop during the recession. So uh, will rates drop during this recession? Historically speaking, we have 50 years of evidence to say, yes, they should probably drop at least a point. So buy the house today when it's not competitive, especially if you need a contingent offer to do a trade-up. Get it done while you can and just plan on refinancing the thing in a year yeah. or a year and a half. So why are the rates so high? Um, for the people who are a little bit more technical, the mortgage rate is really two components. It's priced off of the 10-year treasury. So when the government borrows money for a 10-year period, that's called a 10-year treasury. So historically, it's that price of the 10-year plus a risk premium because mortgages for homes are a little bit more risky than a government bond is going to be. And if you take a look on the lower part of that chart, you can see the average spread, the risk premium, between that 10-year bond and the mortgage rate has been about 1.7% on average over the last 50 years. And it bounces a little bit, but not a lot. And currently, we're 2.5%, almost a full point higher than the historical. So if all we saw, saw happen in the market is that the people that like to invest in mortgage bonds on Wall Street if tomorrow morning they woke up and they suddenly just felt a lot more stable about the economy and they didn't feel like there was a lot of volatility and risk, odds are that risk premium would decline to the 50-year historic average. And you'd see mortgage rates go down by 0.9% that day. Um, is that going to happen tomorrow morning? Not very likely, but it could happen over the next year. So when people talk about mortgage rates declining over the next year, a large part of the source of that decline is this risk premium. And that's assuming that the 10-year government bond has no change whatsoever. Just the perception of risk changes would drive almost a point drop. 
In addition to that, I think it's highly likely once the Federal Reserve feels like unemployment's under control, like you talked about earlier, they'll stop raising the rates. And then probably six to nine months after that, they'll start loosening the rates up a little bit. Okay. The knock-on effect of that is that the 10-year old price drop a little bit from that as well. So there's two reasons why the mortgage rate should be dropping. So to say that rates will drop by 1%, it's it's a layup. Like you've got two great reasons why that should happen. So something you said here on the previous side, just talking about you know uh, buying a property and refinancing a year yep. or two later. I've been a big fan the last few months of the two one buy down program. Yep. I think a lot of people are familiar with it. If you're not, uh, whether you're a, a buyer or an investor or an agent, get familiar with it. Because I was actually in a misconception, like oh, you buy the interest rate down, and mm -hmm. actually if you refinance, you lose the money. That's not the case. You get a refund, don't you? Yeah, because actually yeah. that, that buy down you're doing, that money sits in escrow. It's a for, prepayment of the interest. Yeah, it's a prepayment. Yeah. It sits in escrow for 24 months. And so learn about the program and also talk with your lender. Most lenders I've talked to who are offered saying, hey, if you refinance, come talk to me first and mm -hmm. I'll do the refinance for you a lot cheaper. Because, you know- if I've already got a current file. Yeah, the current file. Plus if, uh, you know, lenders, they want to keep your file as well. They have it. It makes it easier for them. Yep. You get a better deal as well. So definitely put the 2-1 buy down on your radar. Really, really good program out there for owner ox. Do we have a program recorded on that yet? Um, We do, but I think it's buried a different one. We should probably do a separate just like cut out that one clip because yeah. that would be, I think, something that people would really get a lot of benefit yeah, out of. Yeah, is anyone out there, I'd just type it in the chats or maybe Jules, you can throw a poll up there. Who knows? Oh, you can't. Who knows about a two one buy down program? Or would you want us to, you know, specifically publish that for you? Yeah. Okay. We do have one comment in the chat. Justin says one thing on the two one buy down is they're less likely to refund it to you, but will instead apply it to your principal. Uh, yeah. Same thing. So yeah, I yeah. I'm not a lender. None of us are lenders. So so take the big picture of what I'm saying there, and then talk to a licensed professional lender uh, for the exact details. But yeah, Justin might might be absolutely right. Oh, it sounds like it is. Um, yeah. So for your guys that's like an FHA buyer that's putting out a relatively small down payment, the fact that they might get two or three extra percentages of equity added in, plus the house may have appreciated a little bit since you bought it a year ago, mm -hmm. that might be enough to get you out of like an FHA program into something that's a little bit more attractive, or maybe your mortgage insurance goes down. I mean, there's like a whole slew of great things could happen just from that one small little change. Oh, yeah. That's a great point. Yeah. So I said, uh, we don't get the details on here, but everyone, if you're not familiar with it, go check it out. Um, and make sure you talk with the lender for the all the details and how a potential refinance may work. Yep. Cool. So um, why is there so much squawking by the buyers uh, right now? And why are they so reluctant to go out and buy? And I think this chart does a better job than any that we've got expressing why that is. So this just takes, if we took the, uh, this is like going back like uh, since 2000. So it's like 22 years of data. If I took the average home price in America at that moment in time, the average mortgage rate, and I figured out what's my payment going to be. And if I compared that to what the income was at that time, what percentage of the family income would be burdened by this mortgage? And the answer right now is about 25%. It's as high as it has been in 22 years. Um, not as high as it was in the 70s and 80s, but recently it's definitely at the highest. So this is a big part of why uh, the, mor the mortgage rates have slowed down the entire market. It's also a big reason why I don't expect to see a whole lot of price appreciation anytime soon because if we have price appreciation in the face of constant mortgage rates, that means that burden is going to have to go up and a lot of people just won't be able to afford to do it. So I think that you're going to see prices stay relatively stable until you see those mortgage rates go down. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I've, uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm, this chart's really cool. This is, I didn't realize about the, the total load because I mean, People, you know, they go off their monthly payments. What can I afford? Totally. And what can I just, you know, what can the lender give me? And hey, I got five thousand a month in salary. Mm -hmm. How much can I put towards a two thousand or three thousand dollar rent check or mortgage payment? I did not realize it was that high. That is really interesting. I, I would bet if you asked a lender, you know, when you pre call a buyer based on their income and their assets, they they, they qualify for three thousand bucks a month of debt is the most that they can afford to carry. I bet you ninety percent of the time that they're within like a rounding error of that maximum that they're, they can afford. Well, I think uh, we got some lenders in the chat, maybe Lonnie or Justin are lenders. Oh, uh, Lonnie will, will If know. that's Lonnie. Yeah, he says Western. that's correct, yep. yeah. Um, so here's a good comment. David says that's considering a 20% down payment. Uh, mm -hmm. The number is even much higher with a 5% down payment. Oh yeah, for sure. Great yeah, those, those guys are definitely uh, stretching. Yeah, the, the guys that are putting 20% down there, they could be first-time buyers, particularly if like a family member is helping them with the down payment. But your first-time buyer is typically going to be like an FHA putting next to nothing down. Mm -hmm. And they've had it for three or four years. They've outgrown the house. And now they're selling it to trade up 
and that trade up equity is where the 20% came from. So these are, you know, largely, uh, you know, move ups with this scenario. Yeah. A great point. Okay. Um, do increasing uh, rates impact the market? Well, I think you guys all know the answer to that. So here's the last. Oh, uh, sorry. One thing on yeah, there. Yeah, please. Just, uh, I'm going to read from, I think this is Lonnie Glessner, a lender. 30% uh, ratio is the old standard. And I found many buyers want a payment, le payment less than 30% of their gross monthly income. Yeah. I think just because they feel stressed by their student mm -hmm. loan uh, and then you know, used cars and new cars have skyrocketed in prices. So the burden for uh, car loans is at an all-time high as well. So, I mean, collectively, all this debt really is a, it's an anchor on the economy. So uh, this little chart gives you the last couple times that the mortgage rates suddenly went up by at least 1% within a year period or less. And what happened to home prices? Uh, on average, they went up by 8%. Um, what happened to the number of home sales? On average, they went down by 11%. So uh, when rates go up quickly, you should expect that volume would go down. So what we're experiencing in the market right now is exactly in accordance with what you've seen, historically speaking. Since we saw rates go up by 3% in a, like a nine-month period, it's no surprise that our home sales volume is down more than 11%. So no surprise there. This will probably work its way through the system in another six or eight months or something like that. So. Are we getting any closer to getting back to quote unquote normal? Um, so this chart shows you the number of new home mortgage applications. The MBA is the Mortgage Bankers Association. So all those loan officers out there uh, will send a note in to their boss saying, hey, I had this many guys apply for a new mortgage today and I had this many people apply for a new refinance. The refinances are, are summarized on a different index. This is just for purchase business only. And the heavy blue line in the lower left shows you the activity for this year. And you can see that we're at, uh, you know, eight or nine year lows. Um, this chart's like two weeks out of date. The last two weeks were pretty similar to that. So what I'm hoping that we'll see as the year progresses is that we get through this recession, rates start to decline a little bit. And that blue line, instead of being at the very bottom of the stack of options, will start going up maybe towards the middle. That'll mean we have a lot more buyers who at least have been approved for a loan and that's the first step in the journey to actually getting them into a house. Um, but right now, we're just not getting a lot of people at the very front end of the funnel. It's tough to sell someone a house they don't have a loan set up. Hey, Lon, can we go to the previous slide? Yeah. We have a question from David. How long does that take to flush out? Great question. Um, I tried to look at this a couple different ways to come up with like a good answer to that. So that's a really great question. And it seems like it's 12 to 18 months. Um, but the problem with that is that that's looking back at history where the mortgage rates went up by like a point or a point and a half. So I don't know how predictive that would be in a situation where rates went up by 3% really, really quickly. Um, so would it take a little longer? Probably, but we don't have any history to, to know. I mean, just from general sentiment, I mean, people are starting to accept it, at least having like conversations yeah. and there's less like freak out, but that's, you know, very just sentiment talking to people, not data driven. Right. Yeah. I'm so fascinated by this loan employment, High interest rate spike, low inventory. Such a strange time. How does this work out? Because if you're, yeah, your payments go up, but your rents will probably go up too, unfortunately. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we've seen a lot of growth in rents lately. So the National Association of Realtors is expecting a flat year for home prices this year uh, with some further declines in unit count. That sounds like a pretty good forecast to me. That's probably on average what you'll see. Every city will be a little bit different, of course. Um. So this shows you the number of listings that are under contract. So through uh, November of 22, you could see like it was getting worse every single month. Uh, December was about the same. If you want to, if you're taking notes, it's like I think minus 38. Uh, January was quite a lot better. It was like in the mid 20s. And February, although it's not published yet, will be even better yet. So uh, I think that you're going to find, looking back, that November was probably bottom dead center for this slowdown and that we're crawling our way out of it. And so this is listings in our contract and saying 36% lower this November than the previous November? Yep. Okay. So an important thing to keep in mind is that 2021 was a record year. We sold a ridiculous number of homes, the best that we'd ever had. Why is that? Because mortgage rates were super low in 2021. And we gave out $2 trillion to the economy. So everybody had like a huge pile of cash they were just really excited to spend. So even if we wouldn't have had an interest rate shock, odds are really good that the 2022 numbers would have looked like a pretty big decline mm -hmm. off of the incredible fire economically that we generated in 21. I really think like the, the comparison you want to look at is 2019. 
you know, before COVID, before we gave two trillion dollars out, that was like kind of our last normal year. Um, if you compare 22's volume to 19, it's down, but not nearly as dramatic as this chart makes it to look. Yeah. Great, thank you. So anyway, if you're working with buyers, the time to buy is when no one else is trying to buy because it's a lot less competitive. Uh, so take advantage of this window while it lasts. Cause I, I'll tell you, I don't think it's going to last. I think that you're going to see inventory is going to be tight. The buyers are going to come back to the market. We're going to be back to bidding wars within a month or two. Yeah. I think, I think one thing that Chris made a good point on too is that, you know, these there's a lot of lender incentives out there right now. You know, we didn't have that prior when the market was hot. Yep. You know, there was 50 offers on one property and people were not even going and they weren't even looking at it. They were just throwing an offer. And now, and I've got friends buying houses right now. I talked to an agents uh, and investors that are buying right now and they're advising their clients. It's a great time to buy, not only because that refinance opportunity later on, but you mentioned the two one buy down. There's a lot of other lender incentives. My buddy's buying a house right now. He gets a ten thousand dollar credit, you know, towards whatever at closing. So, I mean, you're not competing with a bunch of buyers right now. You could be the only one putting in an offer, yep. and, and you're going to be in a prime position when the rates go down, and right. you can pull that a lot of that money back out uh, likely down the road anyway. So, I think it's you know, every day I'm having these conversations. I'm sure Zach is too. We're talking to right. people all, all day and. I think it's a great time for those reasons. Oh, it's a really good time to yeah. be out there as a buyer. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it. Well, I mean, your daughter just closed in a house a oh, month or two ago. This right? worked out great. Yeah. <laughs> we uh, were helping her sell her old condo and then she traded up to uh, a really nice house and we bought this. We put her on a contract, I guess, probably three months now. But the terms that we got were so much better than we would have gotten, say, in January of 22, you know, buying in November of 22. And then we found a bunch of problems in the inspection. We got a bunch of things out of the seller. We wouldn't have gotten any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was for her. It was a fantastic time to be a buyer. Yeah, yeah. There's proof in the pudding. I mean, yeah, you're giving the trends and eating your own dog food. I am. My daughter, I'm <laughs> trying to coach her. Like, you've got to yeah. take advantage of this window. It's not going to last for right. very long. And we really uh, scored a good place for her. So, for those of you guys who are working with buyers, uh, whether they're owner occupant primarily or even on the investor side, this shows you the rent trend uh, over the last couple of decades, and you can see it's a pretty uh, steep amount of increase in the average rents. And the blue line on there, I just said, well, if rents went up by 4% a year, because that's what the average has been for the last 30 years, if they kept going up by 4% a year, what would the rents get to like another five years out? And this kind of gives you that forecast. So I think if you could share this with your buyers and say, you know, is this really something that you want to subject yourself to? Or is it time to take action and get your life under your own control? Yeah. I mean, especially like, I mean, there's numerous charts and your castle has, and there's a bunch of the internet, but you look at this chart to like... The cost of buying a house versus renting um, for the vast majority of locations around the globe in the country, like it makes sense to buy. And in five years, mm -hmm. even if you bought the worst time in five years, you come out usually ahead yeah. with a lot more money saved. So like, yeah, there's so many ways you can dig in the state and also use it for yourself. And if you're real to your clients, um, but, you know, hey, prices are flat. They've gone up. Mortgages have gone up, but so have rents. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the narrative that we need to be talking to our clients about as well. Yeah. Excellent. So what's next for apartment pricing? I want to spend a, a decent amount of time on this. And it's good as we've got uh, 20 minutes. So I'll probably be able to spend 10 minutes on this section. So here's what the rents have been doing recently. Um, they've been going up, but the pace of the increase has been slowing down. And I think that if we were to be able to get this chart through November of 23, you'll see that it'll be close to zero on average for the entire country. There's a lot of multifamily in the pipeline. So something important to know that happens during recessions is that we see destruction of households. And what, what I mean by that is that during uh, economic expansion, you create new households. So you have a kid who gets a job, moves out of his parents' basement, gets his own place. That, that's one additional household we've created. Or you have two roommates living together and one of the guys gets a raise and one of the guys trades up to a better job and they say, you know, I like you, but I don't want a roommate anymore. So yep. they both get their own place. We've created one more household. And every time we create a new household, we've created one more incremental unit of demand, either buy a place or to rent a place. So we're absorbing inventory out of the system. In a recession, you destroy households. So the two guys who moved out to get their own places, one of them loses his job, the replacement pays three bucks an hour less, and they move in together as they want to be conservative. So we've, we've, we're renting one less unit than we were the day before. Or the kid who had gotten his own job 
uh, suddenly it's like, you know, I'm not feeling too confident about this. I'm going to move back in with my parents. So that's one more rental unit that's being put back into inventory that before was being rented out. So we create households in a good time. We destroy households in a bad time economically. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yes. what's going to happen this year is you're probably going to see close to, if not a record number of new deliveries of new apartment units in an, a recessionary environment where you destroy households. So demand for apartments is going to decline a little bit. So the result will be is that vacancy rates will have to go up a little bit this year. If vacancy rates go up, there's going to have to be some pressure on the rents. We're not going to be able to raise the rents as much as we normally would. That's going to primarily be seen in A-class product in really prime locations because most of the new construction isn't C-class in a crummy neighborhood. It's all A-class stuff downtown, right? Yep. So most of the investors who are on this call, I'm assuming, are like me in that you know I don't have stuff downtown. I've got a 12-unit in Aurora. Uh, so for the people who are not in Denver, you know, that's not Cinderella's fantasy castle land. You know, it's just a working class place that isn't, you know, the prettiest, but it's, it's okay place. And it cash flows better than the stuff downtown. And it cash flows a lot better than the stuff downtown. So um, rents are going to be flat probably this year. Or if you have the ability to separate them out, what you'll see is the A class properties will actually have negative rent growth. The C class properties will continue to go up a little bit. And you mentioned just the pipeline of apartments. Like I know the Denver pipeline and I also see the Denver Gigantic. skyline. Yeah. yeah. Is the is the general like just trends across most major cities kind of like how Denver is where it's been undersupplied, a lot's coming online. Is that a pretty similar trend, do you know? I just don't know the, the national trends. God, I could um you should really write that down. So we could do a fifteen minute article just okay. on that one great set of questions that you just asked there. Um the quick answer <laughs> I'm sorry, my nose is a little bit stuffed up, is that the Construction pipeline has been building for a couple of years, at least in Denver, because A, getting permits has been really challenging. Um, and then there's a labor shortage. And then like if you want to get like a thousand amp breaker box for a medium sized apartment building, it's like literally a one year wait to be able to get that breaker box. Oh. So even if you got your permits today and you could build this thing in nine months, you can't even really start your electrical work for a year because you can't do anything without the panel being in place. So there's still some major supply chain issues. There are still, I mean, okay. generally speaking, most supply chain problems are a whole lot better than they were two years ago, but there's still these little spot things here and there that are just like enormous problems. Mm. So the amount of time that it takes to build an apartment complex, at least in Denver, is much, much longer than it normally would be. So uh, things that we started building or permitted two years ago are coming online much later than we anticipated. And I, I think that's broadly true probably across the entire U.S. That's one factor. The second factor is there's a lot of developers who right before this change in the economy, let's say it was March of 22, where rates started to go up really pretty quick, they got their project approved, they got their loan locked in. Everybody up until that point, those projects are all going to go. The guys that were on the margin, a lot of times they would like decide, well, maybe I'm not going to progress with this. I'm just going to put it on hold for a year or two and wait and see. Now the rates have gone up by three points. You're not if, if it's even close to penciling, you're gonna go. You're done. Yeah. <laughs> so you've got a whole lot more pressure to push pipeline than you normally would until the rates come down. Does that make sense? Yep, that so makes sense. Those are two really big drivers. In Denver specifically, there's something unique that wouldn't apply in most cities, in that uh, there was a the city council passed a lot of rules that makes it a lot less favorable for developers in the city and county of Denver to build apartments. And everybody who got grandfathered in before that date didn't have to comply to everybody after that does. So there's like this gigantic landslide of people just running, running, running to make the deadline. And then the day after that, like it was just crickets. Mm. So uh, we've got, uh, <laughs> we've got like a lot of apartments under construction in Denver. And maybe if you like you're in Austin or, De or Dallas, you know, you probably do too. Yeah. Lonnie mentioned an interesting point right here in a prediction. He said, I think many new apartments plan will not get built right away as the deals don't pencil out now with higher rates and potentially dropping rent. Yeah, I don't think uh, there's a whole lot of new apartment complexes getting yeah. launched since about April of last year. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that would be one of the drivers that goes with that for sure. Good point. Monique mentioned another thing here because I know this is on the docket for uh, Denver, I believe, uh, but potential rent control passing. I know I think half the states have it banned. I think it's on the docket for Denver. Yeah, they're talking about it. Or not, but I think that'll be an interesting thing. I mean, as mm. far as apartment demand and new construction, I mean, if anything like that passes, I know Minneapolis, Minnesota, they've got that in place. Yep. Um, so it's interesting to see. I don't think it'll pass. I'm not, you know, I'm totally speculating, but it's an interesting point right there. And I think it's super important for what the future of apartments look like in, you know, Denver and nationwide. Yeah. I think it was the city of St. Paul within the Minneapolis, yeah. St. Paul uh, metro area a couple of years ago said, we're going to have rent control. And the number of new apartments, like instantly, like the next day, it was like, we're done. Yeah. And the apartments that were in pipeline, uh, there it's much easier to do a condo than it is here. 
uh, most of the apartments turned into condos and there was like no new deliveries and they were already short of units. So it was like really tough to find a place. And it like created like a housing crisis for St. Paul. So they've mm -hmm. actually had to back off on how draconian their rent control rules yeah. were. But hopefully that'll be like a case study other cities could learn from rather than having to repeat the same mistakes. And I've seen a few interesting studies. Rent control is usually good for about maybe one year at best. Yeah. Maybe the renters win for a little bit in the long run. Landlords and rentals, everyone just loses. Everybody loses. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Um, I forgot to do this earlier, but as a quick note, uh, I just did share the slides if you guys want to download the PDF on here. So you can download that in the handout section. Or if you ever need in the future, reach out to any of us or anyone at the Ear Castle, J Par, and we can give you a the slides or future slides as well. Super. So let's talk briefly um, about the relationship between the 10-year treasury and cap rates. So if you're an institutional buyer of a larger complex, you're probably borrowing on five or 10-year terms. So you're either going to have your loan priced off the five-year treasury or the 10-year treasury. I, I picked the 10-year just for this one. Mm -hmm. I could have picked the five. It would have been the exact same answer, just a slightly different shape of the lines. So the, the dotted line shows you the average interest rate for a 10-year treasury, and the rate that you would borrow at will be that rate plus some sort of a risk premium, not dissimilar to the, the mortgages for residential homes that we talked about 20 minutes ago. The orange line on here is the cap rate for multifamily over the last 40-some years. And what you notice is that there's just not a lot of correlation. So I think a lot of people have this belief that as interest rates increase, cap rates have to increase. And the logic of that is sort of airtight to me. It makes a lot of sense. But the problem is that it just doesn't agree with the history. Yeah. I was one of those people until you showed me data <laughs> last year. I was like, oh, all right. Lon changed my mind yeah. again. So, well, like, gosh, I mean, would it make any sense for someone to buy uh, a place with a cap rate that was less than their, their cost of borrowing? And like, well, gosh, 1979 all the way through about 1992, I'm trying to read this from across the room, was it 13 years? Uh, we had 13 years of multifamily sales where the cap rates were less than the average rate of just the 10 year, not counting the risk spread above that. So normally what happens, like if you look from like 1985 forward, there's a relatively decent spread, maybe two, two and a half percent, three percent between the 10 year and the cap rate. Most of that would be the risk premium. So the spread between the effective borrowing rate and the cap rate is always sort of like razor thin. So, uh, just because rates are going up doesn't mean that the cap rates have to go up. So just as an FYI, historically speaking, will they go up now? I, they might. I don't know. I, well, I, I, actually, I think they will, but not by a lot. Yeah, I was actually, I was actually uh, one of my friends here uh, runs a, a commercial brokerage in Denver, and she texted me a few weeks ago, just like she did like year over year deal closing between like November and November every year. And in November 21, they closed 65 units. Denver Metro in 22, they closed 16. Yeah, so it classed by 75%. Yeah, I mean, so like your residential goes down 30, 40%. Uh, commercial was hit way harder. Yep. So rather mm -hmm. than cap rates going up and prices dropping, the brakes just got hit really, really hard, right. what it looks like. And why is that? Because a lot of sellers are sitting on a loan that still has some life on it that's at a really attractive interest rate. So mm -hmm. I'd like to be able to sell my property and move on to the next project. But if the buyers aren't willing to pay the price that I've got in mind, I'll just wait it out. And I think you're seeing a lot of that all over the market. Mm -hmm. So um, let's take a look. When did the 10-year treasury quickly spike by at least 1% or more? And it turns out there's nine times in the last 40 years where that happened. What happened to the cap rates when the mortgage rates spiked? And the answer is, on average, they didn't change at all. And you could see every one of the data points there. They went up a teeny bit. They went down a tiny bit. But generally speaking, they didn't change. So let's look at it through the other end of the prism. There's been nine times in the last 40 years where interest rates dropped by 1% really quickly or more. What happened to cap rates? Did they go down? No, they didn't change. They just stayed the same. So, I mean, in the day, there's just really no correlation between interest rates and cap rates. That's the, that's that's the punchline, right? That's the punchline. Yeah. So you could test this for yourself. This is the 10 year over the 10 year treasury over the last five years. So you can see. In late 2018, the 10-year was at about 3%. We're at about 4% right now. So between like you know July of 2018, we've got this 3% treasury. And if you take a look in July of 2020, it dropped down to like 0.7. So it dropped by 2.2%. That's a huge drop in the treasury. Think back to your own transaction experience over the last three years. Did cap rates drop by 2.5% between summer of 18 and summer of 20? And no. No one saw any change in cap rates. They no, were all flat, right? Yeah, I mean, nothing like 
that dramatic by any means. Yeah, I maybe mean, by a tenth of a point or yeah, something. Yeah, I mean, they got compressed a little bit, but... Nothing like that. Yeah, no So, no so the rates dropped by 2.5% and nothing changed with the cap rates. And then let's look at it from July of 2020 to now. Rates have gone up by three points. What's happened to cap rates? They've gone up a little bit, but not a lot. And that's exactly historically what we'd expect. Now, will this time be the same? I don't know. I mean, you never know what's going to happen, but the history would suggest that we're not going to see a large increase in cap rates. What I'm interested, we've talked about this, is that some of these loan terms come due. Yep. Like, hey, you know, they underwrote it here and rents aren't going up like they thought or some operators maybe weren't as good as operators as they were. I'm starting to hear some people having the, the lenders, hey, you might need to sell this soon or put up a million dollars. I'm curious how that will play out. Yeah. Yeah, they hadn't factored in that interest rate increase into their underwriting. Yeah. Maybe they were being a little too aggressive, but now right. the lender wants their money back with the higher interest rates. Not their money back, but they want that capital call to, right. to, to yeah. make up for it. And it's an interesting time period that we're in right now, I think, because of that reason. Especially. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So really quickly, for those of you guys who are newer to real estate investing, I thought I would just illustrate something for you. So um, how does the cap rate impact the value of a building? And this wouldn't just be for multifamily. It would also apply to industrial or warehouse or in retail or anything. So um, what you can do is you can take your rents minus your expenses, and that gets you NOI, net operating income. So if you pay cash for your building, you don't have a mortgage, that would be your cash flow. What's customary uh, is that you would take the NOI and divide it by the cap rate, and that's one estimate of what the building will sell for. So take the middle column there. If we, if our office building or multifamily can generate $100,000 of NOI, and we're going to sell it on a 5% cap, the building will sell for $2 million. So what if that cap rate changes by a tenth? So on if it goes down to 4.9%, when the cap rate goes down, the building value goes up by 40 grand. If on the other hand, the average cap rate in the market goes up by 0.10, the value of the building goes down by 40,000. So cap rates and building prices move in opposite directions. Does that make sense? Yes. So a lot of what's been happening over the last couple of years is that as borrowing costs have gone up in the last year or so, we're still on the backs of really massive increases in rents. And while operating expenses have also gone up, they haven't gone up as fast as rents have. So we've seen incredible net operating income growth across most of multifamily. Mm -hmm. So even if the cap rates have gone up a little bit, which they probably have, the increase in the cash flow has been enough to absorb it. And that's why you're not really seeing a material change in the pricing. Wow. Does that make sense? That makes sense. Yeah. So what's going to happen <clears throat> this year is that you're going to see that the cash flow is not going to go up because we're not going to see much rent growth. But mm -hmm. you're still going to see expenses go up because of the lag of inflation. So there's a decent chance that net operating incomes will go down in 23 versus 22, especially for A-class buildings, not so much for Cs. If that's the case, even if cap rates stay steady, building prices would probably drift down, if only because of those things. If we see the cap rates go up a little bit, as well as decline in cash flow, then you could see some real compression in pricing. What that means then is for the guy who's got four years left on his loan and he's at a really good rate, he's just going to sit this thing out. But the guy's got one year left to go on his loan might be a little bit more motivated. Mm -hmm. So I think you're going to see some opportunities in the commercial sector to pick up some op some decent pricing on deals. Um, you're just going to probably bring a little bit more cash down. Maybe instead of getting 20% down, you got to put down 25. Uh, your your rate's going to be nothing to talk about, right? It's going to be pretty high right now. Be just refinance it in two years. Yeah, but a lot more a lot more of those deals are going to more the experienced operators. Yep. Because yeah. if you're newer to the multifamily space, commercial lenders are not lining up to give you loans. Yeah. No, but they're if you're not. an experienced operator with capital and a proven track record, you're going to get a lot more options and probably better terms than like I would, where I'm not. You know, I never bought an apartment building directly myself before. Right. Um. So Dave, that's a good question here, Lon. Why are the inverse of each other, cap rate and value prop? It's just the math. So, it, I mean, it's it, you take the net operating income divided by the cap rate, and that's the value of the property. So if the cap rate goes down, the value has to go up and vice versa. It's just a little teeter-totter that you're you're manipulating there. I'd recommend uh, type that into Google or YouTube, and in five minutes, you'll see a bunch you'll of You'll see examples, a great video. David. Yeah, um, it explains it out Yeah, well. that we can do a much better job than we can in a couple seconds on a webinar. So just, just YouTube that one. So for those of you guys who are newer to investing that are on our webinar today, um, if you're buying something that's four units or smaller, usually you're going to have a normal commercial, uh, normal commercial, you'll have a normal conforming sort of a loan from a normal sort of a loan officer. And those properties oftentimes will have a 30 year fixed rate. So all this volatility we just talked about is not going to have a lot of impact at four units or less. 
where it's going to matter is five units above. By definition, is a commercial loan. And nobody issues a 30-year fixed rate on a commercial building. Like five years is usually the best you can get. For the types of things that people on our call can afford, um, if you have a larger building, you can get a 10-year fix, but that's not common at like five. That'd be more like at 50 units. So the opportunity we talked about a minute ago is probably in the space from five units and up, not the four units and below. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, Mike. absolutely. And <laughs> if anyone out there is saying we're, I know this section is in more advanced stuff, there's a bunch of classes and also materials that Lon and Eurocastle has. If you're on the newer investing side, reach out to one of us or reach out to Jeremy Lambert, which are plugged into uh, all sorts of classes and resources because I learned investing from Lon uh, a number of years ago and great source to learn from. Yep. So we're almost out of time here. I want to make sure we save some time for questions. So um, if you would, please give us some feedback. What I can do, if you like, is each month we could do a very short 10 or 15 minute version of this. It just covers the new material only. Mm -hmm. So for most of you on the call, I think you'd want to dial in for that. So like, I, I'm not going to go through the apartment pricing because that's not going to get updated for probably a year. But a lot of the other stuff on here will. If you want us to do that, let us know and we'll build it for you. And then we'll probably run this once a month with the entire presentation for someone who hasn't seen it because it's a, a lot of information for uh for that yeah definitely please give us feedback because i mean that's we want to deliver really good content and mm -hmm. good classes to everyone so type in your questions here we got uh, three or four minutes left and then also make sure you download the handouts as well if you want these slides and they are great 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 material to uh, just study download and use their clients or kind of fact check once you see a crazy headline somewhere as well. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Doug summed it up. He says, agree, love the no spin, regular fact-based content. Try to uh, strip out the media bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to talk just really briefly about Airbnb uh, and short-term rentals. And you're going to see uh, that it's going to be softer next year than it was this year. And the reason for that is that a lot of sellers have these great interest rates they may have moved on to the next property and had enough cash just to be able to buy the next property. Well, they kept the old one. And instead of selling it like they normally would, they just put it in the short-term rental pool. So the growth in the number of short-term rentals is growing much faster than demand for short-term rentals. Mm -hmm. so as a result, occupancy in SDRs is down. And that's going to probably continue for sure this year. I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that if we have a recession, that there'll be less demand but the supply side will probably still continue to increase. So the vacancy increase in SDR this year could be like a pretty material sort of a jump. So if you already own SDRs and they're profitable, um, just hold on. This is going to be 18 months of turbulence. It's not going to last for very long, but it's going to be less profitable in 23 than it was in 22. If you've been thinking about SDRs, uh, check it out to see if the math pencils out for you, but it's probably not going to be quite as rosy as it was last year. That's the, the high line uh, uh, headline for this section. Well, I know we're at the hour mark here. That went by in a hurry. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, Lon, it's always a privilege uh, to get here and learn from you. And I always love to be able to get to ask you questions directly. I got a few bullet points from my own investing and talk to my clients. So thank you. You bet. Uh, Nick and Zach, thank you guys for coming yeah. on here as well. And everyone out there watching the webinar and the class and the download in the future, thank you so much. If you have any questions, need other resources in the future, other investing topics, other trends, other markets. This is the tip of the iceberg of what Lon and your castle has. Reach out and there's a lot more data. I see a bunch of thank yous in there. Thanks, so guys. thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All you guys are welcome. Will you see you next month, if not sooner? Bye, everyone. Thank you.